Let's go before the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the privilege and honor of speaking to your people, Lord. These are your people. Oh, Lord God, and what a, an honor and a responsibility it is to bring your word to your people, Lord God. Let your anointing be upon your word, upon, upon my lips, Lord God, as I speak. And, Lord, let us open our hearts and our mind to you, Lord God, that we may glorify you and we may learn of you and you alone. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. A few weeks ago, there were a number of us went over to Brother John Jones's church and uh, for his dedication of his new building, right? Oh, yes. And he had a gentleman there from Nigeria that was kind of hard to understand a lot of times. He said, I'm trying not to preach because if I get to preaching, you won't understand a word I say. So I'm trying to teach so I can slow down enough to enunciate so you can understand he still got to preaching on, her, on more than one occasion, and I would lose what he was saying. But he said one thing that really caught my eye, and I wrote it down right there. He says, there must be an offering on the altar. There must be an offering on the altar. We come and come before the Lord God all the time. And are we bringing him anything? Are we coming and just saying, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Well, we got the gimmies, don't we? I mean, yes, listen to our own prayers. If we could record our own prayers, I don't think a lot of times we'd really like what we end up praying. Lord, give me this, and Lord, give me that. And you know about this. Did you see what that one did? What does Jesus say? He says, what's the first thing? Pray like this. Yes. Our Father, yes. Holy, yes. Yes. holy are you, Lord. Woo. Oh, bless you, Jesus. And I don't think we need to stop with just... Holy are you, Lord. Now let me get down to business here. I think we need to come before Him and get in His presence. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek yes. my face. Yes. There's a whole lot to that. Rather than just, oh Lord, thank you, holy. Now, Lord God, I need that new car and I need this and I need... No. We need to come and offer up an offering of praise Lord and worship Jesus. to the King yes. of Kings. Amen. And then, ah, uh, then the rest of it kind of fades away to me. Sometimes I forget about praying about all the other stuff. I really do. Because there, if I come into his presence, all the other stuff seems, seems to melt away. What it does for me anyways. I'll tell you what. Once you get before him, everything else takes a back seat. Way in the back seat, in the back of the bus. All that stuff that I was so worried about. And oh, Lord, all this stuff. No, no, no. But I want to come and bring an offering before him. So I wanted to take a look at what this word means. Offering in the Hebrew. In the Old Testament, it was written in Hebrew, right? In the Hebrew, it means to bring near. Or that which one brings near to God. Something that we're bringing near to God. Oh, Lord. And what's he say? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I want to come near to God. Amen? Yes. My first offering is me. Amen. I want to come and say, I want to be close to you. I want to hold you. I want to hug you. I want to be in your presence, Lord God. Of all things, that's the first and foremost thing. I want to bring myself near to you. Yes, yes. And that's what he says. And it's so awesome. It is so amazing. Lord, I'm coming. And I want to come near to you. Now, what do we bring when we do that? So I started in the Old Testament. Leviticus 1, verse 2. In verse 1 there, he says, And uh, the Lord God spoke to Moses from the temple. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, you want to be near the temple so you can hear his voice. Amen. Amen. I want to be close. Yes. Seek my face, right? Yes. I want to be close to him. But he says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd and of the flock. Any one of you. Are you anyone? Amen. Amen. Hey, so it isn't just the, the lucky few that can come before the Lord, right? When any one of you comes before the Lord for an offering, that means you can come before the Lord. You can come for, before the Lord. Everyone can come into His presence. All we need to do is come humbly 
Yes. We humble ourselves and pray and yes. seek His face. Ah, I can come into the presence of God most high. But it starts with that blood offering, the livestock, something that's got blood in it because there's life in the blood. In the blood. There's life in the blood. Now we know that Jesus in the New Testament solved that problem altogether, but we're going to take a look at what it really means here. It says, in, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. And we had just read in verse 1, which I didn't put up there, whatever, uh, that God spoke to them from the tabernacle of meeting. They have to be close. They have to bring it, bring it be in there close. But it says, let it, number one, be a male without blemish. So they're taking out the very best of their herd or best of their flock. Not just any old, oh, there's, there's one over there, go grab that one. No, he wants the very best one that they have. The very best. Not some junk thing. So when we come before the Lord God, we need to bring our very best. And it had to be something to them. This meant something to these people. Especially if you were poor and you only had one or two sheep anyway or a few sheep. And you take the very best one you've got and you're going to sacrifice it to the Lord. You're going to offer it to Him. The best. The best. Nothing but the best. And think about this. Number one, this was their livestock. They made their living off of that. This is how they made money. And not only that, it had to be a male. So that male would reproduce. You can have all the females you want, but if you don't have a male there, you're not going to have any reproduction going on, right? So not only would that, it would be their increase, right? So they're taking the very best one, and whenever you're breeding animals or something, you want to take the very best one, right? And breed with the very best one so you get the best uh, lineage that you can get, right? And, and dogs, uh, Pat has been breeding dogs forever, and has got all kinds of awards and everything else because he takes the very best that he's got and breeds it with another of the very best and they reproduce fine animals. But if you're giving your very best one to the Lord to offer it to Him, man, you're putting your faith in God Almighty that you're not going to end up with a bunch of blind cross-eyed sheep and everything, right? I mean, you're giving your very best. I <laughs> like that part of it. I haven't seen too many cross-eyed sheep, but of course I haven't been around a whole lot of sheep either. But I've seen some where their eyes blue had, had uh, blue eyes. One blue north, the other blue south, right? <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So, but a male without blemish, a perfect animal. And this had to mean something to him. But it shall offer it of his own free will. Hmm. Offered of his own free will. He didn't say, I'm going to take that one, I'm going to take that one. No. He wants us to say, I want to give you this. I'm putting more faith just as we did with our tithes and our offerings a minute ago. We come and say, I put more faith in you, God, than I do in my little check. Or I do in the, the very best thing i got. The very best thing I've got. I'm putting more faith in you. I'm coming and giving it of my own free will. He doesn't say, I demand that you give it. As a matter of fact, when he talks about the tithe, the first thing he talks about is animals sheep. He yep. says every uh, tenth sheep that passes under the rod belongs to the Lord. It is His. That's how we can say in Malachi 3 that we are stealing from Him if we don't give Him His portion. It is His. It belongs to right. Him. So we can't say we've given Him anything if we give Him, uh, or if we don't give it to Him, we're stealing His money, right? So it's the same thing with the animals. He wants us to be coming there of our own free will and saying here. So they were giving their most prized animal that was costly and were able to reproduce. It was a free will offering, not given grudgingly. Not coming, going, the Lord doesn't want you to give it to him. If you're going to be all upset about it, don't do it. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not going to do you any good. Well, I give it to him, you know, here's the thing. Mm -mm. No, I'm putting my faith in you, Lord. Where else can I go? I, your word gives life. You give the words of life. And I'm going to come and give everything I have to you. <clears throat> then we go to Leviticus uh, 2, verse 1. 
It says, when anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Have you ever taken fine flour and put oil in it and then put incense on top of it? I don't think it tastes too good for any of us, right? I don't think I'd want to eat that after it put frankincense. It was frank incense. Incense is what it was. Uh, so thinking, hmm, okay. So take a look at it. Now you've had the blood offering. Now we have the grain offering. Fine flour, the best grain, free from impurities, and it was fit for a king's table. Amen. Do you think it cost these guys anything? Yes. You think they ate that all day? day? They ate just regular old flour, anything they can grind up, right? But this stuff was reserved for someone that was important. This was reserved for the king's table and the king of kings table. Yes. Amen. This wasn't something they got to eat. It would be like us taking steak and lobster and taking it over and saying, here you go, Lord. And watch the, the, the priest go over there and burn it up on the altar. Yeah. Oh, man. And, and, you know, I don't get to eat steak and lobster, but uh, two or three times in my life. You know? But they were bringing the very best animal they had and the very best of their fine flour. Then talking about the olive oil. It's a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, right? Oil. Oil is on it. And a symbol of blessing and prosperity, but it was a vital part of their everyday diet. Something they ate every day. So now you're taking flour and oil, something that they rely on to eat. That was a mainstay of their diet, was bread, right? This is the formula for bread. And they were going, oh, Lord, here you go. Here's part of the thing that keeps me alive day by day by day. I'm coming and giving it to you. Does that make sense? Are we making sense with everybody yes, here? Amen. Good, I got one that's making sense too. Praise God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. And then frankincense was costly incense that was imported from South Arabia and East Africa. It was a luxury. It was made for the offering, made the offering a sweet aroma to the Lord. Remember it says that there would be a sweet aroma to the Lord? This made it a sweet aroma to the Lord. He wasn't going to eat it, but it sure smelled good as it raised up to it. But this was an imported luxury, a very costly item. Now they had to come up and cost them every aspect of their life. Their most prized possession and their land, the thing that would sustain them, the things that would give that make them reproduce and continue to have an income, their sustenance, their stuff there that they ate every day with the flour and the oil, and now they had to sh shuck out lots of money for this highly priced frankincense. And all that went. So it's hitting them in the pocketbook. It's hitting them in what they eat. It's hitting them in their future, basically, in the, the reproduction of this animal and everything else. Provide them meat and everything else. They were giving everything, and it had to be the very best that they had. This is hitting them hard, right? I mean, this, it was something, this was an offering. This was a sacrifice that they were doing. Are we doing anything near that? I am not going to answer that for anyone else. And I'm not going to answer for me because I know what the answer is. Yes. I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah. But today, people, instead of giving the best and you know, everything, mm -hmm. unlike them, we have to go pay the light bill and the house and everything. Yeah. The grocery yeah. bill and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably getting into your words. So <laughs> We're about to get to that, as a matter of fact. Uh, and then, and then verse 13 says, And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. I am offering this to you, Lord God. And with all your offerings you shall offer salt. What did Jesus call us? The salt of the... Salt of the earth, that's what it was. Salt of the earth. I'm offering me. I'm Bless offering you, Lord. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, boy. I'm giving you not only the best of everything I have on this earth, I'm giving you me. 
I'm giving you yes. me, Lord God, and I will not bring my offering without that covenant that you made with us. God, Jesus, sir, but God calls us the salt of the covenant of your God. Cannot be lacking. There's a covenant between me and God Almighty, and God calls that the salt. That's the thing that makes it season. That's the thing that causes it to be preserved. It's a preservative, right? They, were, they didn't have refrigerators and freezers and everything else back then. They had to pack it in salt. And it preserved it. I need it to be preserved. Amen? I need this covenant between my God and me to be preserved forever. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He does not miss a beat. Amen? Verse 14 says, If you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to the Lord. First fruits. Like Pat was just saying, first fruits. Well, after, like Pat was saying, after I pay the light bill, and, and well, of course it's got to be after the the uh, the government takes their money. I mean, you know, I got to pay my taxes and all that. They take that out of my check. I can't do anything about that. I mean, I can't do anything about that. Yeah, you can look and see how much you actually made before the government took theirs. It isn't, let's see, uh, well, let's see, okay, God, you paid me this much, and then the government comes next, and then you come after that. Yeah. No. It's either he comes first or he doesn't come at all. That's he it. He said, put me first. You will have no other gods before me. We can't put the, the, the government ahead of God or else we're making that our God. And too many of us rely on the government for all our sustenance, all our support. How many, I forget what the percentage is, but it's a huge, more than half of the people in this country get some kind of assistance from the government. I'm on Social Security now, praise God for that, but I paid into that, right? I paid into that. And I'm on, Social, uh, I'm on uh, Medicare as of this month. <laughs> praise God for that. Again, I paid into that, though. But it's got to be our first fruits. He has to be first. And again, if you're giving your first fruits, it's, oh my goodness, I hope the rest of this crop works, Lord. You know, I'm giving you the very first thing that comes off the vine. I'm giving you the very first thing of my crops and everything else. And he's saying, okay, I'm putting my faith in you that the rest of this crop is going to go because I'm going to give you everything that I own. Uh, he says, it shall be the first fruits of the green heads of grain were roasted on the fire grain beaten from full heads. The full head, the whole thing. Full heads. Not after everything else has been taken off. I remember when I first got a hold of tithing and offering, the enemy came to me. I mean, we were in desperate straits. We had just had a house repossessed back in the 80s. We just had a house repossessed. We're looking for the car to be taken away at any time. Couldn't pay the light bill many times. We were just barely, or a couple of times, we had to go in and have them turn it back on and everything else. And got a hold of this. And I got $12 in the mail. I, I owned a business, and, and owning your business isn't all it's cracked up to be all the time, right? <laughs> but I got a $12 profit come in the mail. And I'm going, man. Our kids were relatively young at the time, maybe seven or so, uh, eight, and they needed milk. They really needed milk. And I looked at that, and I was going to give the tithe of 10%, right, a dollar twenty, a whole buck twenty. And I was going to go berserk and give another 30 cents on top of that, make it a dollar and a half. I was just going to throw it all out there, you know what I mean? I was just going to throw it all out there. Go for broke, boy. And the enemy whispered in my ear, you can wait till next week, you know, because your babies need milk. And you know what I did? I burst out laughing in his face. I said, are you kidding me? You think I'm going to put my faith in a buck and a half instead of in the God Almighty that promised me, that told me in his word? This is this isn't even anything to consider. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I just burst out laughing. And I didn't look back. I didn't look back. <laughs> Praise God. I was listening to the radio the other day, and they were saying that the average American family owes $15,000 in, in credit card bills. Fifteen grand in credit card bills. 
Praise God. I never thought I'd, I'd uh, own a house, that's for sure. Our house is paid for. Were you going to say something? I was just going to say that uh, the, the principle of, of first fruits, mm -hmm. there was a brother in this church who was here for years and years and years. Yeah. And he took it so literally that he planted a little garden beside his house. And the first tomato, yeah. the first cucumber yeah. that came off that little bitty garden, it, it may have been one cucumber or one tomato, but he brought it to me. Yep, yep. His first fruits came right. to yep. the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He took it so literally mm -hmm. that if there was a pepper, yeah, he'd take the pepper and bring it. Yeah, yeah. That man needed to say his life was truly blessed. Yeah, I'll tell you every what. way. The word says, I think it's in Leviticus and in Numbers, that uh, says the tithe belongs to the priests, the Levites. He brings it to the priests. That's what it says. See, every other, and I'm not going to get into this, but there it is. Very simple, very, very simple to, to figure this out. There were 12 tribes of Israel, right? 12 tribes. One of them did not get any portion of the land whatsoever. None whatsoever. All the other 11 tribes got a portion of land. This is your area over here. This is your, They could grow crops on it. They could raise sheep or cattle or anything else to make money off that land, right? But the Levites didn't get a, a portion of the land at all. They did not get it. They were to work in the house of God most high. They had priests and then they had people working behind the scenes, taking care of the animals and everything else, bringing them in and the upkeep of the, of the sanctuary and all that. Uh, and so they didn't get anything, but in, in, I'm pretty sure it's in Numbers 23. I'd have to look it up. It's been a while since I looked it up. But God says, my tithe I give unto the Levites for their service in the tent of meeting. I give the tenth of that comes to God Almighty goes to them. And the offering took care of all the, the actual physical needs of the sanctuary and everything else. That's where it worked. But then you go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. So you've got 11 of them tithing 10% to the, to the Levites. That's 110%, 10 times 11, right? Mm -hmm. They're making money. They're making more than us. But right after that, he says, but the Levites shall give a tithe of the tithe. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So they were making exactly the average pay that everybody else was. Isn't that amazing how God works that out? He, they were not getting rich. You don't have guys driving around in Lexuses and living in mansions and with air-conditioned doghouses. <laughs> they were making the average man's pay. Absolutely average. If people did it the way they're supposed to. Praise God. I want to say that in this church, I am overly blessed, we always have been, that God Almighty meets the needs of this church, and I am so appreciative of that. Uh, but our people don't mind doing what God says to do, amen? amen? But His Word is true, it doesn't matter what we do, what we say, or what we think, or anything else, our God is still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we come and we bring the grain of the first fruits. We give it to him and not, any, not anywhere else. Praise God. And Numbers 28, 7 says, And if it's a drink offering, shall be one-fourth of a hen for each lamb. In a holy place shall you pour out the drink to the Lord as an offering. Now, we've talked about before, every twice a day, they would take a lamb and slaughter it. They would have to have the, the bread offering, the, the grain offering, and they would also have a drink offering. And they would take this wine, and it had to be the best wine that they had, and they would take it and pour it out. Pour it out. And this wasn't the junk wine. This one, remember when Jesus turned the, the water to wine, right? And the guy comes and says, wow, everybody else gives the good wine out front and then uh, brings the, the bad wine out and everyone's kind of drunk, you know. And he says, no, you kept the best for last. This is the best wine that they could have. 
the best of the best. And they would take it to the Lord. Here you go, Lord. Pour it out. Now that would just make some people go, hmm, wait a minute, you know? What does that mean? What is that all about? So we're going to take a look at that. Let's go to the New Testament. Philippians 2.17. This is Paul, of course, writing. And he says, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering, on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. I'm being poured out. If you ever said, well, I'm just pouring myself out to everyone, right? They're just pouring themselves out. I'm giving you everything I've got. And every time I come, and I know Brother Bill can attest to this, that you come and you preach and you get the word of God, it feels like at the end of it, you're just completely drained. Drained as if you've been poured out as a drink offering. Given everything. that There's no more of that wine left in there. They took, take it and turn it upside down. They pour it out. And we have to be ready to pour ourselves out for Him. Amen. He was giving Himself for the church of Philippi. I've been poured out as a drink offering, a sacrifice of service for your faith, for their faith. Wow. That's giving everything He's got. Everything I got, Lord, I'm pouring it out for you. Nothing left. I'm not holding anything back. Right? Does that sound like a, a good offering to you? Amen. That's a drink offering. Amen. And I'm glad. <laughs> if I'm being poured out for the service of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice for the privilege and honor of pouring myself out for you. That's why I say, I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Call me. I don't care. Yeah, I'll wake up. I, I think I can handle it. I, the Lord will, you know, I won't die. But praise God, I get on to Miss Beth sometimes because she doesn't call me. Get two o'clock in the morning, she almost called you. Why didn't you call me then? Because <laughs> you know? she, she falls or whatever, and that's got to stop. But now we're into the New Testament with the, with the drink offering and pouring ourselves out. Offering in the Greek now. In the New Testament, New Testament's written in Greek, right? And I believe Brother Leon knows a little bit about great, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it, it means a bloodless sacrifice. That is from their dictionary. A bloodless sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? The blood has already been spilled, hasn't it? Yeah. Jesus' blood has been spilled. Jesus gave his blood so we don't have to, right? He's not saying for us now that there will be many martyrs, and there have been many, many martyrs, over the centuries, and they're being martyrs right now. They're giving their lives for the uh, for the sake of the gospel, Amen. right? But this is it. Literally means a definition of offering in the Greek is a bloodless sacrifice. I'm giving everything of my own, everything I've got. I'm laying everything on the altar for you, Lord. For you, I'm not going to hold anything back. And it says tender, especially to God, giving. In other words, tender, this is legal tender, right? I'm giving everything, especially to God. I'm giving it to his representatives, my brothers and my sisters that are all around me, right? I'm not holding anything back. I'm giving it all. I'm being spent. I'm being poured out as, a, as an offering, but as a bloodless sacrifice. He doesn't necessarily want our blood. He wants everything that we've got inside. I'm not going to hold anything back. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny himself. That is what it means when we give ourselves up. He says in, in uh, I think it's in Luke, he says, deny yourselves daily. In other words, I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm not my Lord anymore. I'm not my own Lord anymore. I'm not going to do whatever I want to do. This world says, you're the boss. You ain't the boss of me. Well, he is the boss of me. Amen. If he's not the boss of me, he is not my God. Amen. I'm my God. I don't want to run my life anymore. That's how I came to him. Is I got tired of running my own life and doing it my own way. Because I kept messing it up. It didn't matter what I did. It was always the wrong thing. I was great at doing the wrong thing. I mean, I nailed it every time. I was excellent at it. 
you know. And I got tired of that. I said, Lord, it doesn't matter. I swear I'm doing the right thing. Exactly the wrong thing. And my thought was, hey, if I'm doing what God Almighty is telling me to do, I can't screw it up anymore. I can't get it wrong. How can I do the wrong thing if I'm doing what God Almighty tells me to do? Amen. Right? Oh, man. It takes the pressure off. Talk about set you free. Come unto me, all your heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Oh, man. I don't have to worry. I can rest. I don't have to say, well, I gotta go, I gotta get out there and do this and I gotta do that and everything else. No, 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 no. What do you want me to do today, Lord? What do you want me to do? You lead me and guide me. See, the beautiful thing is, is Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Now, some of us hearing different ways. There's it, and there's no way I can say you gotta hear him like this. No. So most of the time it's just a little urge in your heart, you know, it's like, wow, I just, I just get a feeling like I need to do this, and I get a feeling I need to do that, and everything else. Every time I come and, and give a word, I never, ever go under my own power. I, not even what it is. Most of the time, by Thursday or first, a lot of times, I don't even know, by Friday morning, I wake up, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. Not a clue. Or you show me. I mean, like I said before, any preacher that's worth his salt should be able to open the Bible to any page and preach. I mean, it's the Word of God. If it's not in you and you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, it, it, you shouldn't be up here trying to preach, right? But I want to know what He wants to say to you today. This is far too important. Way too This is You're God's people. And he has given me the responsibility and the honor to share his word with you. I don't want to come up with something out of my own head. That's for sure. Lord God, you show me and I will wait. I will sit and wait until he shows me. Just like this. Uh, uh, Friday morning, I was sitting there, Lord, I need to know what you want me to pray. Talk about on Sunday and and because I knew yesterday I had all kinds of stuff I had to do. So he gave me this. He, he reminded me, and I have written this down on a piece of paper. There's got to be something on the altar. There must be something on the altar. And I went, okay. And sat down. At that point, it's just looking up the scriptures and everything and, and listening to what he's got to say. Our God wants us to deny ourselves. I can't do this by myself. I'm denying my own wants and desires. I want to do this. I'm, a, I'm my own boss. I'm, I'm going to go out in my own power. No. I'm not going to say, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, is which is what most of the time is our prayer to God. Lord, let me get my list. I'm going to write down my list because I want to make sure I get all these different things that I want, and this is how I want you to do it, everything else. I'm not against making a list because sometimes we forget. We're too, for, too forgetful. But we need to take a look at it and think about what we're asking for. Is it all me, me, me? Or is it Lord God? You show me. You use me. Wash me and cleanse me. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Lord, take this. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Denying ourselves, Romans 12, 1, this sums it up right here. I beseech you, therefore, and that's a strong word, and, and we don't have a word like that right now. I beseech you, I'm begging you, basically, therefore, brethren, this isn't to the world, this is to God's people, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Holy. And I, and I know it's holy, H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y would also work as well. Completely. I give myself completely to you. I'm presenting my body. I don't do what I want to do. I don't go where I want to go. I don't do anything. But Lord God, you do. You tell me. You show me. You lead me and guide me. If you say to not go this, do this, I won't go there. If you say to go and do that, even if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm going to go do it anyway. 
because God sent you there. I was talking with my nephew yesterday, and he is learning some of this now that he's got, given his life to the Lord. And he said, it's amazing how different things happen. I can't believe how God keeps blessing us and, and moving on us and showing us different things and bringing us things that we need and everything. We'll pray and say, Lord, we got a need. Jesus said, that's okay. Give us this day our daily bread. That's okay. Give us this day our daily bread. Didn't say, Lord, I need this. and I need, you know, Lord, take care of me today. But Lord, first I need to come into your presence. Right? Yes. And all of a sudden he's learning that once he's given this over to the Lord, the Lord is just blessing and blessing and blessing and blessing. But as we give ourselves a living sacrifice, I'm sacrificing my own wants and desires and giving myself as holy to the Lord God Almighty. I am not leading a life of it or any kind of open sin. I'm not doing whatever I feel like doing it because the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life will kill you. It'll kill you. Lust of the flesh. Oh boy, I, my body wants to do all sorts of things. Don't want to do that. I'm not going to allow that to rule my life. Amen? The lust of the eyes. Boy, I see that new car and i got to have it. Got to have that new phone. Oh my goodness, Lord, there's a brand new one. I know I got this one last week, but there's a new one. I'm like, yeah. mm -mm. No. In the pride of life. Let me be puffed up in front of everyone. I want everyone to see me. No, I don't care if anyone sees me or not. I want to. It's got to be Him. If my Amen. desire of being up in front of you is not to show you Him, I am worthless. Absolutely worthless. I have to be giving Him glory. That's why I have always and will always put myself down and Him up. Amen. If he be raised, lifted up, amen? Uh, yes. i got to lift him up. Because yes. if I'm up there telling you about how what, what a great guy I am, number one, I'm lying. <laughs> That's a big lie because I ain't all that in a, in a bag of chips, right? Mm -hmm. But I am here to lift him up. Mm -hmm. I want to praise him and praise him alone. That's why I give him all the glory all the time. So that's what we should be doing. That is our reasonable service to come and say, Lord God, use me. You are my Lord. There's got to be something on the altar. There's got to be something on the altar. If we are not giving ourselves, we're wasting our time. What good is it? Amen? Amen. Praise God Almighty. You know, we've got Rudy and Carrie is out there in California.